he's going to circle Caleb Johnson 100 times. He's going to go, we have to just call every single play to stop this guy because they haven't thrown for 100 yards yet, so make them throw. Welcome back to the NF Podcast, where we cover Iowa sports. Today, we're going to do a brief breakdown of the Iowa versus Ohio State game, move into a preview of the Iowa versus Washington game, wrap it up with some big news around NIL, uh, some key transfers out. That's actually going to occur on a Patreon. Today's the first day that we're actually going to have 30 to 45 of extra minutes of content available on that page. In case you missed it, we finally have our podcast on Apple Podcast. If you prefer that met- method of listening uh, to YouTube or Spotify, feel free to jump over there. And the link will be in the description. Without further ado, we might as well kick it off, get into the Ohio State breakdown. You know, when we came into the game, the two things we enunciated as the two keys to victory were stopping the run of Ohio State and being the more physical team. I think from the jump, Ohio State, we definitely caught the worst side of the physicality argument. You know, mm-hmm. They came out, Travion caught you know two or three of our safeties flush with hits. You saw multiple defenders on the D-line end up on the ground over and over again. Mm-hmm. It was the first time where in this big moment game, it wasn't necessarily a scheme, you know, offensive skill talent. It was simply just a domination on both fronts. Although you were able to keep it tight, you know, until the third quarter, kept it into a seven-point game, I think everyone in this, you know, the Iowa fandom knew that game was over. I don't really get the overreaction. You know, it's a sense of almost we're trying to find someone to blame. You, know, you want to go out to bl- blame Kirk and... Of course, he has the comments post game about sticking with Cade. We're 25 years into this operation. Asking him a question where you're anticipating to get gaslit and then getting gaslit and reacting to it is <laughs> a, kind of a funny thing to see. K- Kirk's not going to get on the stand and diminish a player that played, you know, actually was the lone bright spot of the team in the first half. Obviously, had uh, his issues in the second half, but everyone got dominated. To point to Cade and say he's our issue here. I think the emotional reaction to, to these the blowout losses, it's more trying to find someone to blame than just the simple fact that these guys are just better. Mm-hmm. You know, that's such a difficult thing to accept for Iowa fans. Yeah. And we've had moments where we've competed with these upper echelon teams. The fact of the matter is that you caught Ohio State essentially peaking. They might be peaking this generation. You know, mm-hmm. they obviously have a national title. Uh, in the 2000s. They've had some great teams. This might be their best team. This might be the best team in the country, and it might be by a head. Yeah. It, it's just so hard to, like, break down this game. I think, like you mentioned, you come into the game saying stopping the run, running the ball, possibly, you know, on the table for Iowa in this game. And I've never seen, our like, our D tackles collide before. Like, we saw Black and Graves get bounced off each other, both in a gap on top of each other by being moved. I saw Black on the ground within the first, like, 10 plays. I saw Bo Steffens get absolutely, you know, destroyed by Tyreek Williams on a a double team that's supposed to create, you know, movement. He's losing a half yard on it. The perceived advantages in this game on the line of scrimmage or the only hope of, like, keeping this game close were almost instantly dissuade of giving us any shot. And from the outside looking in, you know, if you were looking at the score and you saw it 7-0 at halftime, you're like, oh, Ohio State's kind of struggling with Iowa. And then you do like the two seconds of checking the box score and you go, oh, it's 18 yards rushing to 187. You go, oh, I don't care what the score is. They're getting, to, it's like if Illinois State was seven, like it was the Illinois State game. It's like we didn't have the big lead at halftime. But you but, felt comfortable. But the game was over yeah. and both sidelines knew it. And that's like going into halftime at 7-0. I'm like, I don't see how we win. And that's just a crazy thing to say. And it, it honestly gets highlighted by that Jeremiah Smith play at the very start of the first, second half where we were just waiting for this death blow to occur. When you are, when the line of scrimmage is looking the way it is, when we already had the disadvantages of the passing game on both sides of the ball, they just had to make one play. And you literally plug in the guy that has already looks like he could be drafted in the NFL in the first round as a 17, 18-year-old. And the play he makes with the double move where he just shakes our best corner and then gets over our six-year safety with ease and gets underthrown and still... There's a five-yard underthrow, and he still... Still made the play. Still made the play. And then the very next play, he mosses our guy, shoves him easily, who is like a developed junior in our program, one-hands it, and then shoves him after the play. It's like, we're not playing the same sport as these guys. And and that's okay. Like, it literally is just a capitalism in a three-hour span like if we just would throw you got just got taught capitalism in your you you know, just one-on-one got, econ yeah you got you yeah. got it was capitalism and econ like that's a 20 million dollar roster 
And that's like not, and if you did future value, if you want to do a future value of like future it's cash flows, million it's a $200 million roster. Yeah. And I'm not going to like blame the Iowa players. They played their heart out. Like Schulte got <laughs> murdered by <laughs> Henderson on that uh, first run. He literally, he could have dove and grabbed, tried to ankle pick him. He tried, he could have like, you know, act like he was making a tackle. He literally stood there and goes, my only hope is turning my head to the side and just getting ran over. And he did. And like, you see a lot of Iowa players in this game. Like it wasn't like they weren't trying. It wasn't like the coaching staff wasn't, didn't have a good idea how to play this game. Like our boot pass, the very first boot pass we ran to. It was fake. It was the first, it was like with the fourth play of the game. Yeah. Like we ran a boot pass and nothing was there instantly. Cade made an incredible play to get one yard. I think he lost a yard and Cade made a great play. So it was like. I don't know, from the first snap, if you're watching the line of scrimmage closely, you knew where this was going. Yeah, from the first snap, I actually I think we had a successful run on first down. We saw a double team move up. And we're like, we both turned to go, we turned to each other and go, okay, the line's gonna play well today. Yeah. After that, it was just utter domination. We talked about how, okay, if they're gonna not be, you know, forced to roll up against this uh pass attack, it's gonna get ugly. We the one thing I texted you about prior, I think after RBZ had his breakout game against Illinois State, and like, okay, well. Now we have an option against press man when we play Ohio State. It's going to be back shoulders. The two back shoulders we we threw to him, he ended up on the ground. One got picked. The other one was a near pick. It just, the level of talent was so strong. I, I had no idea it was going to look like that. I thought there was going to be some you know competitive plays back and forth. Obviously, the defense held up and passed pro fairly well. You know, made Howard make some questionable throws at times. You had a couple it's, near misses where you're like, oh, we might get a pick there. We obviously had the Castro pick. He had the fourth and two stop. But the way the run game was looking, I think the, a great play to break down on this was early second half when we were down 14. We ran a front side slant. So how Iowa sets this up is they play you head up in your inside zone game for the entire game. Then eventually when they're trying to get that first down stop where they're going to give you a light box, but now we're going to action one of our, you know, our, our little games inside. They do a front side slant. You get all your players uh, in front of their guys who are trying to reach step them and you're feeding everything to Jay Higgins. We run that play, and Jay Higgins misses the tackle. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, okay, we just called our best you know, counter. We got the look exact look we wanted. We have our best tackler against the running back, and it went for 10. Mm -hmm. And that was just kind of the epitome of the game, is even when we were on the front foot, even when we had a, a great design play, it didn't matter. Another way we can go back to is the flea flicker. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, it's beautiful. One of the most beautiful flea flickers actions I've seen in college football. Just great design. Got unlucky with it that you you got a man call against it, but that's where we were at as an Iowa fan. Is like you're going to have to hope for you know some some luck. You had some early turnovers to keep you in the game, but that team is just immensely better. And it's not QB play. It's not Kirk not going for on fourth and one. But we could, let's break and go to the fourth. Well, I, I I'll do, do one, one more play. Camera. One more play on that too. Of dominance. Like, if you, like, it's hard to just, this is like a baseball manager for the Twins going against the New York Yankees roster in the playoffs. Like, it's hard to blame him for his pitching decisions. So, anything is just, you kind of feel like you're punching down to our coaching staff because I don't know what coaching staff could have prepared us mentally for that. I mean, and like schematically for that game and won it. It's just, there was just so many talented players on their side. But one of them was, we're trying to get out of the first half and we're on our own four yard line or whatever it is, maybe five. And we bring in an additional lineman, Cade Piper, like we did against Minnesota, and they didn't, you know, change their set to it. Neither did Ohio State. Ohio State stayed in nickel against a two tight end set where one of the tight ends was a uh, offensive lineman, you know, our future center. And Kate Ransom, who's going to play in the NFL one day, just blew through our backup lineman that we brought on the field off of C gap and just completely ended the safety the, versus interior line. It's safety versus a, like a center, and he blew him up at the line of scrimmage and stopped us for two, like negative two yards. Like that's a good decision. You're in a for sure running play, bring on your for sure running set. They don't even counter. They're not even making that smart of a coaching decision in that situation. They have so much overwhelming talent that even when they're not in the personnel they need to be in, they just stop you for less than three yards. Like it's hard to, it's like the reality of college football that these teams exist and you only play them. You know, we've only played Ohio state a few times. We run, like you said, we ran to an iteration of Ohio State's. That's different. They brought in Downs, Judkins, Howard, and Jeremiah Smith to a team that was one of the best six teams that, that could. took the national title winning team to the brink, and then they got better. 
And then they added four guys that are like all going to play in the NFL for as long as they want and yeah. are like possibly all going to be pro bowlers one day. So it's okay. Let's, let's move into the fourth down call. Cause this is where we disagree on this and Ohio is you're even if you get that first down. So I, your, your point is you're not going to, you're not going to win this game by scoring 10 points. I can give my point. Okay. Well, I think Kirk saw the only way the run game looked originally. Kirk saw the only way that you get a, a short field and a potential score is through a pin. Mm-hmm. And that was going to be the entire game plan. So at the 50 yard line, you know, the, the look came in. He didn't get the look. I don't know if that's Kirk's call. That's probably coming in from the pop, the press box. One of LaVar's, you know, under guys who's looking for the look he wants. Once that doesn't, you don't get the look, you call the timeout. Mm-hmm. I get then not going for a sneak is a little bit, you know, cowardly. It's, it's frustrating in the sense it's a 7-0 game. You say you go out, you're probably going to execute a sneak for a half a yard. Mm-hmm. Your offense is still not going to go out and move the ball against Ohio State. What he is- actually sees in these big games where his offense is entirely outmatched is that the, the best way to get to that point is to get them on the five yard and in. And that's how you're going to slow down the game clock. You know, the game's going to get really short after that. Mm-hmm. It's a part of this whole ethos of how he plays that game. And I think his love for that punt is just what most people don't understand is that that opportunity to punt the ball. And I'm, I'm honestly behind it as long as you can freaking execute it. Mm-hmm. The fact that we had two opportunities to execute a pin, I think actually maybe even three. One time Nestor didn't make a play on the ball, and the other time we kicked a 20-yard punt. Uh, it was on that actually opportunity. Mm-hmm. Where you have to shift your mentality is if you don't have a consistent punter. I think he's gotten used to having Tory, where we played a whole game out of Penn State's end, mm-hmm. where he put, could put it on the seven-yard and in, and that makes a whole lot of sense. But it doesn't make sense when you have an inconsistent punter who well, can't execute it. That's why I completely disagree with what you're saying. Like, well, it's it's punter based. No, but, it's not punter based. How? It's all right. It, first off, it is punter based. He hasn't been able to do that punt all year. So is it punter based? So it's the first one. But the reason why it's just not. He doesn't have a proof of concept that that's actually how you win these games. Is it, what game have we won in the last against Michigan, against Ohio State? We're not. You're not going to win. You're not, you're, so his entire goal gets to the fourth quarter, right? Get to the fourth quarter in a in a one possession game. You're not going to get to the fourth quarter in one possession game if you have zero points. And that's what that punt doesn't matter because you have to go score. It doesn't matter about slowing them. They will score 10. If it's 10 to zero at the fourth quarter, we lose. So you have to go get your touchdown to equal the game. Secondly, they are running the ball at will, and we're not running the ball. So if your assumption is that we can hold them to a three and out. It's a wrong assumption. From the very first play, it was a wrong assumption. They're getting six yards of carry. So if you are if you say we pin them deep, they'll be turtle up. They're not going to turtle up. Well, they're not going to turtle up, but you can definitely be very aggressive against them. But most likely, that's still going for eight. Like, we saw from the very first possession, they were running the ball at whatever they wanted to do. So you are, you're watching this in the first, like, up to that point, they've, they look scary as hell on offense. And now you get the, the ball at the 50-yard line, and you have the opportunity to score and actually equal the game. The assumption that, like, you can't score from the 50, that's, like, the assumption you're not going to win this game at all then. So you're, if you're going to have your pre-assumption that you can't score from the 50, if you could even convert that, then it's... Did we break the 50 with our starting unit? Yes, we did. We missed a field goal. Oh, yeah. We, one, we, one we, no, we went to their, their side of the field three straight times in the first half. Pretty sure. Well, at least a 50. So it's like you're moving the ball, but like if if I'm Illinois State, all right, let's say we're playing Illinois State in week one, and we know how that line of scrimmage play was going in the first half. Like they, they were moving, we were moving them, they weren't moving us. If Illinois State punts from the 50 yard line in a down by seven, I'm that's losing football without a doubt. It is, and it's it's just not actually playing the actual variables in that game of what the run games look like. You have to, you're in a ass kicking, you're getting your ass kicked. Let's be honest, like up front, you have to play like you're getting your ass kicked. You can't play like we have this, actually our defensive line is going to show up after the second quarter. When, when's the defensive line ever got better in the second quarter? So I think the assumption that you're going to stop the run. I don't, but I, again, if it's pinned on the two or three, you can then blitz your safety. There's, and you can blitz your play side linebacker. We didn't, we didn't do that the entire game. Yeah. Well, it also, the, the, the punter just can't do it either. So it's like, I, I think... I agree with if if the punter is reliable and you can you have when you had Cooper DeGene running that play too he looked a lot better catching that punt down there or stop the punt. Mm-hmm. 
Kirk needs to put that on the shelf until we can show we can do that consistently. Special teams has been shit this year. He just wasn't it's, aware of like what the team can do and what the game was happening. So I, I, I that's like a his, he made a historical choice to punt the ball in that situation because it works in 2021 against Penn State. It wasn't a present decision. That's my argument. Yeah. Well, I, I just you get the first down, you're still 50 yards from score. Yeah. You know, it's you're gonna. I, I, I'm not. I, you know, that's what we we are the exact same page. That call affected it zero part of the game. zero part of the game. We can argue about it as much as we want. Yeah. I can I can make a stink about it. People can make it online. Like we said, decision coaching decisions in that game had zero, like li- almost zero effect on the actual outcome. Yeah, based on the personnel. Well, last last point I want to make is just uh, the points about Cade. You know, of course the blame comes to him quickly. First half w- was legitimately the lone bright spot. Had a great little survival play where he did a double pump and hit a late in over the middle. Looked like it's actually his old Michigan tape. Uh, had other moments. Obviously had the big miss on the deep ball. If you make that play, potentially you you know that probably leads to a field goal at best. You make the other field goal, you're in a seven six game. You know you're you're playing a little bit more football than you were. Uh, but all, other than that, like the timing on all the routes, uh, the design of getting the ball to Gill, Lachey looked good against man to man. I think that's going to be a thing we build out going further when play, people play man to man. I know people are going to you know, detest us de- uh, defending a 98-yard performance and how it looked in the second half, but we we told you this. The minute we get aggressive, the minute we're in a, a 14-0 game, a 10-0 game, we're forced to step back and pass, it's going to get ugly. Like, mm-hmm. This is just this roster is not – with the receiver play that we have, the pass blocking play we have, the lack of mobility we have at QB – Asking us to step back and pass against an elite pass rushing team with good, with great, you know, secondary play, it's just not real. It's a fake thing, mm-hmm. and putting that all on Cade just feels like a little short sighted. We're going to get into actually why we want to see Sullivan potentially full time. It's not going to happen this game because Cade played that. Cade had that first half. You still had the Minnesota game where he, you know, protected the ball and you scored thirty one. Knowing anything about Kirk, you're not making a QB change at this point because mm-hmm. you've had enough success to continue to try and play out this equation and get better. But it, it just, it, I don't know. It just, I, I want to defend Kate a little bit because to say like, Oh, this is all relies on him playing bad. It's like, no, the O line and D line got their butts kicked. Yeah. Like that's where it started. And the receivers got their butts kicked too. Yeah. Everyone did. Everyone and then, did. so like if like his turnovers in the second half, three of them, and the first one was horrible. Like let's, yeah. that's he, a bad He play. sensed bad pressure. He thought he had two guys coming up behind his right ear. He actually only had one and the guy had an easy rush to him. And, but it's a 14-0 game on the road against Ohio State. The game's effectively over. He was already trying to get in that playmaking mode of like understanding what the like what his percentages are winning. And like he's just trying to press the issue right away and play one. Still, it was a horrible play. Let's not just like give him a pass on that. But you said it perfectly. Like the defense obviously was a bright spot in the first half. He forced three turnovers and held Ohio State to three seven points. The second bright spot is Cades had five or six throws that were really good like on time, on target, accuracy, everything that we've always wanted to see from him. It looked like he kind of engaged in that, the big moment on the road. But we'll get into it later. You know, with it's not just Cade. That's not the passing game. It's the aspect of the receivers as well with out his legs. So even when he's playing as about as well as he could play in that first half outside of one throw, that extended play, which he still extended the play and got to that position. So you Hard to blame him for even getting that throw. The passing game is just where it is. Like you've played th- three power four opponents and you haven't thrown for 100 yards. Like it's hard to even say he's improving. It's hard hard to make the argument that that was a great game from him in the first half. Like you kind of seem silly at some point. And we'll get into it later about like what that means for what this offense needs to become. And Sullivan is truly like the number one answer of he has to be playing 40% of the snaps on first down more or just you know, have a tough discussion with Kay going like, this isn't about you. This is about us just like generating more points and yards. And if we had Brown and Seth Anderson going full board and maybe one other really good receiver, you're, you're still a starting quarterback based on how you're playing. But given our receiver personnel, you don't make a lot of sense right now because even if you play perfect in your world, like we always mention, you know, what is the outcome of the actual passing play? And it's not over a hundred yards in three straight important games. So, but in the end you have three straight power five games where you haven't thrown for hundred yards. So, you got to move on. You have to make some drastic change. I think that's very clear because you still have a very talented team. You want to move on to the Washington preview? Yep. 
Today's show is brought to you by SunSingles Sunscreen. Convenient, single-use sunscreen packets created for every fan's on-the-go activities. For a limited time only, find our podcast's favorite team's game day packaging at the link below for the next tailgate. And don't forget to use code 10GOHAWKS for 10% off your purchase. That's code 10GOHAWKS. So obviously a whole new coaching staff from a team that went to the national title last year. I think what we were looking for, or at least hoping for, coming to this game in the season preview, they had a five and a half win total. Our initial impressions after watching their games against Washington State, Rutgers, and Michigan is this is an immensely talented team that's just trying to get some cohesion, Mm -hmm. especially on the offensive side of the ball. I think outside of Nebraska, this is a, a, this, I honestly, I think they're probably ahead above Nebraska on the offensive side of the ball, but outside of Nebraska, they are, you know, head and shoulders above anything else that I was going to play for the rest of the season. Will Rogers doesn't have insane arm talent, but it's certainly good enough to compete at the college level. Very good accuracy. I think what scares me the most about him is his decisiveness. He gets the ball out quickly. He has every single throw that you need. He has the the line shot down the sideline that's incredibly accurate. His middle, you know, ten yard in looks great. Uh, his deep ball that he floats out there is great. It's just he's just a complete quarterback. Then he also has legs on top of it. They do spell him with a running QB. So we've talked a lot about how teams can expand their playbook by having, you know, a strictly running QB because that allows you to put hits on your QB and remove a man from the box on the defensive side of the ball without threatening, you know, the health of your starting QB. And they do that really effectively. Uh, they're very multiple in what they do. You'll see a lot of under center uh, sets with reduced sets, very similar to what Iowa does. Their spread is real because they have three, you know, big time receivers. Uh, their tight end is used in a heavy uh, in a heavy fashion. Overall, on offense, they're just a very complete team. Mm-hmm. And where their receiver play and QB play is at, and the level of chemistry they've already developed in that space, and the level of talent they have there, it's very scary with how this Iowa defense is operating, especially with a serious question mark at one corner. Mm-hmm. It's le- lending me to believe that they're going to have a lot of success on offense, and that's going to lead to Iowa having to be very effective on uh, the offense side of the ball themselves. Yeah, and it's it's definitely a stats versus film type of team. I think if you look at the stats and the numbers they've put up in terms of just points per game, you wouldn't be blown away by this offense. Like, they've struggled to score against records in some situations. They haven't put up gaudy numbers in terms of, you know, points per game versus even Michigan and Washington State. But they move the ball every drive. And that's what you – when you see them on film, truly the only thing that's kind of holding them back is lots of penalties and missed field goals. And this red zone execution as a whole, which I think comes down to their offensive line. It's not the strength of this team. It's still a good offensive line, but it's not some dominant force the more you watch them. But to break out their personnel, it's we're not in the Big Ten West anymore. Like, that's what this, when you're just watching this film, you're not running into a, you know, Illinois team from a few years back where they just didn't have receivers and you're playing, you know, some six foot you know, white receiver that can't really run or move. Everyone that gets the ball on this team is like fringe NFL. Jonah Coleman at running back is a 5'9", 220-pound running back. That, 230. 230-pound 230 running back that can move. Boston at receiver looks like a high end, you know, going to have a good shot at the NFL. Going to be drafted for sure. Going to be drafted for sure. Moving into Jeremiah Hunter was the other transfer they brought in uh, from Cal. Had over Was their lean receiver with over 60 catches, I want to say 700 yards. And then Giles Jackson, former Michigan receiver, four-star recruit, played early at Michigan, never really developed. Super big burner at the slot position, get over the top on you. So it's, you know, we break down Ohio State the same way where you're like, everyone they're giving the ball to, they can't really mess it up. Washington is just Ohio State light where it's not these, you know, Jeremiah Smith type of freaks, but it's everyone that's getting the ball can still really play. And truly what the only issue that they have is just they've thrown probably too much at these guys. And this Washington team is kind of like, you feel a crescendo coming to this entire squad, like you like defense and offense, because the coaches are coaching. Like they got a full playbook. They're putting their, you know, read option QB in on second down and first down. He's throwing the ball as well. They're keeping you off balance. Really good screen game constantly. Uh, you don't feel like you're seeing the same formation and plays a lot. It feels like they're kind of building to this NFL. They can focus. just attack you in a crazy amount of ways. Yeah. And so they're just getting to this point on offense where, you know, they're putting up damn near 500 yards of offense on in games. They're going to put up probably cl- pretty close to 400 yards and 370 yards against Iowa. And, you know, depending on their red zone execution and their field goal kicker, that might lead to 21 points, you know, 24 points. And it's hard not to see it. Like, 
these guys are just playing well. I think the only, if you want to, you know, critique one part is their office line versus our defense line will be interesting. I think that's something that's kind of a little bit of an unknown at this point of who they played, but they've also got Joel and Coleman over a hundred yards in three power five games. And he's gotten to the second level a lot. So it's not a bad unit either. So it, it's definitely going to be a big matchup. And if the simplistically way to look at their offenses, it's just souped up Iowa State. Iowa State obviously has Higgins and Noel at receiver and Becht and Brommer. But think of it also a better offense line with a better running back than Iowa State had when they played us. And that's kind of where Iowa's sitting right now. It's going to be a hell of a matchup. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting how it all interacts. So you, we can walk through essentially how they're going to attack Iowa defense. I think how I was going to evaluate the game is that we really want to prevent explosive plays with the receivers. They have the capabilities to get over the top on us. Rodgers is insanely accurate, like the 20, 25 yard passing. I saw so many, you know, giant plays in the film from him just, you know, dropping dimes at on fade passes, passes over the middle. So it's going to lead to us playing a little bit more of a passive set, similar to what we saw against Ohio State. What that's going to present Rodgers is. I feel like most teams on first and second down aren't used to the depth that our, you know, our 10 to 15 yard defenders get. You see a lot of ball holding from Rodgers from back to early in the game where they don't realize it's got to be, you know, you know, get your eyes up and then ball's got to come down to a check down instantly. If he's late on that read and he's not, you know, he's because what I've seen from Rodgers is actually a very aggressive QB. He trusts his eyes. He throws picks for that reason because he's going to really trust his arms, going to trust his receivers to make plays. If he plays that aggressive style, that's where I see could see Iowa the Iowa defense having a good day. If he you know wants to make that explosive play in the passing game, that's also a problem because our, his eyes are going to stay downfield for too long. He's not going to get to his checkdown early enough. That expanding balloon that is the Iowa defense that expands and then contracts. If that timing isn't correct, where he's letting us contract before he makes a decision to uh, throw the flat, then we're going to have tackles for two or three yards. If his, the design of the pass is to, you know, show early deep and come quickly to the flats and underneath, that's going to be a lot more successful for them. I think him being the experienced QB that he is, he's going to realize that. And that's going to lead to a lot of uh, movement between the 20s that we always talk about. If I think this, this offense is going to be rather comfortable between the 20s. But what it really comes down to, as you mentioned, is the interaction between the, the Washington O-line and the Iowa defense. If the Iowa defense line shows back up in this game, plays a hell of a game, can limit you know the the amount of movement that's occurring to them to allow their safeties and linebackers to come up and present uh, stop runs for two and one yards at times, that's really where I was going to be strong. If they are seeing early success in the run game, or we're seeing Jonah Coleman get to our second level defenders and be able to you know he's he's going to be a better athlete than a lot of these guys. He's going to be able to make moves on them. That's where we're going to have real issues. And my fear about their offense is what we talked about with Ohio State is they have the capability with Rodgers and the receiver crew to execute the high-end level of football that is required to beat Iowa in the red zone, and that is the fade pass. Mm -hmm. That is the receivers and QBs connecting on those types of setups. Another thing, too, that we're going to break into, and I think you want to talk about this a little bit as well, is formationally. Phil is continuing to get caught by Michigan, Penn State, Ohio State now. I think I believe Penn State was the first team to really push this button in 2021. Yeah. But when we go, when teams go two tight ends, we automatically throw Kyler Fisher out there. We saw Kyler Fisher get torched against Ohio State. We see him get torched against a lot of good teams because what we can, what they can do is if they can get us into 4 3, it's pretty simple formationally how you can then isolate Fisher onto a slot receiver. That is a, an incredibly poor matchup for an Iowa team that's trying to prevent explosive plays in the passing game if teams can go to that in the red zone and we're going to eagerly throw that four three defender out there that's going to be something that gets isolated by this team to the nth degree they're going to put giles jackson on fisher and they're going to isolate him for you know out routes where mm -hmm. fisher can't keep up to him you're going to put boston and you're going to put jeremiah hunter on him and you're going to run fades at him essentially the whole offense is going to be played at kyler fisher if we're not going to you know adjust it's not going to be in big moments either i don't think i think it'll just be First and 10 when we need to get a drive started. Like, you're just going to see them, you know, target them in that moment. And it, it's tough because it, go it, go, it goes against the actual, like, Kirk philosophy of, like, playing football where you're still trying to create simplistic aspects to your program where it allows these guys to play fast and have less responsibility so they understand how to play even faster and helps the coaches make quicker decisions on how to 
game plan and also then have iterations and changes off those game plans. And when you want to have a diverse playbook sometimes on defense and have diverse kind of thoughts of how to play defense, it then limits your preparation of how you're actually going to attack them in the you know second half. But when you don't have diversity in play calls, diversity in formations, and diversity in personnel, game planning for you also becomes easier. And that's what we're seeing against these top-tier teams. You're not only facing these programs that can really – you know, push your buttons athletically and personnel wise, but now you're playing intelligent OCs that are going, you're telling me if I just go strong side formation with my second, my best receiver against a four, three, they're just never going to get out of it. I'm always going to get a Buka on Kyler Fisher in this situation. Like that's like the gamesmanship that Kirk loses in aspects. And you see it all the time in these type of games where he's like very formulaic of how he plays and how he wants his team to prepare and how he built his program. Formulaic can cost you. And it, Formula A can help you. It, it, Iowa has immense ability to, you know, overcome terrible situations sometimes when they're, you know, completely bobbing out or, you know, feel like they don't have the correct personnel to beat teams. But, like, not playing the game at all times and not making those substitutions, not making the, you know, the critical change to your entire philosophy when you need to in games, all of a sudden you end up with David Bell having three straight 150-yard games against you. And, like, that's... That's frustrating to see as fans, but like Kirk can also point to like the stability of the program because of those decisions. So it's it's weird. It's like a it's one of those things you kind of accept as a, someone who watches it critically. You're going, well, that's like what we do, and it's kind of like the foundation of how we play is allowing that matchup to happen, knowing we're going to be attacked that way, and thus we can control that matchup. But like knowing you, how you're going to be attacked too, you know that makes sense. You can then pre- prepare the guys like they're going to try and get over to the top of you here. But I think where it's going to fall short again here is. Deshaun Lee on Boston is going to be, you know, their plan of attack for a lot of a big portion of this game too. And if you're not going to line up a man to man and get very specific on what your matchups are on mm-hmm. third down, I mean, granted, any zone team is going to be, you know, you can dictate matchups uh, as easy as you want to because they're not going to flip sides of the field. Mm-hmm. But sometimes that nuance and, you know, making a quick change and making that last minute change to personnel mm-hmm. is really what's needed. And we could walk through why Phil does this. So when you have two tight ends on the field, when they're going to line up, you know, in your traditional strong side formation, Fisher is in this head up position with a tight end where if he has the key, you know, man and, you know, has to, has to beat his block for any type of edge pressure. Mm-hmm. If it's going to be anything outside, he's really the force guy. If that's cast from that situation, that's going to likely be uh, an unfavorable position. You might lead to them running the ball and under Iowa system, you know, Teams being able to line up heavy and run at you successfully is kind of what makes us fold. We saw it against Ohio State. So our counter is, okay, we're going to play the heavy man no matter what. Because mm-hmm. then they can, if we don't play heavy and we play Castro in that 4 5 they can formationally set us up and have some shifts where they can really isolate, isolate Castro on the box. Right. And now you're playing, having guards build up to Castro. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the choice you're making. I think what we're asking for is just a little bit more flipping that, that coin a couple more times where if you're, you know, you're sensing a second down, if it's a second down and 10, are you really going to see uh, an outside zone call for two or mm-hmm. three? That could go for two or three. Are you, or are you likely going to see a pass? Stay in your nickel set. Don't just let them dictate your personnel to get them in a position where they you can get thrown on. And if you see it early, that's like the number one thing I want to see is like, don't make the change when it's too late. Remember like we, you know, put Moss on Trey Palmer you know, against Nebraska, like in the fourth quarter, and it all worked out finally. Like, it took us till the fourth quarter to do it. And that's like, if you're seeing that attack in the first quarter, and you see them, oh, there's the isolation play. Like, clearly, this is like probably 10 plays they have. Maybe eight of their, like, scripted plays are, like, somewhat a formational attack against Fisher, against this matchup. Like, notice that these guys aren't dummies. You're playing Chip Kelly. Like, if he's showing, like, a good attack that way, and it works, he's coming back to it. And it's not going to be, you know, when you can all of a sudden make that change later. It's not like, oh, well, this is the third and eight. It's coming. Like, make that flip early and then see how he counters. Like, yeah. make, the, make, make, make the counter it. and go back and forth. Yeah. And if, like, If you make the counter flip, then you might have just wiped out seven or eight of his plays. Right. And then he, he might goes, not be prepared to then attack you in that manner. And then if you flip the counter, then if his run doesn't work, then you just stay in it. And you go, all right, F you. You weren't ready for this double counter. Yeah. Now you are now on the back foot in your play calling. You're coming simplistic play. So I... I just want to see him be more like aggressive with that, like kind of like awareness and then just like make them be deeper into their playbook and preparation. 
Well, I think the last point I want to talk about in the offense before we move to the uh, defense for Washington, their shotgun, this is just a quick you know, formational breakdown for them. They really like evened up sets out of shotgun. Against zone, usually you'll see a lot of teams play overload because you can play levels concepts against them. With evened up shotgun, what you're going to see a lot of uh, you know, attack vectors is actually going to be to the short side of the field then. What I would like to do is play a lot of squat corner to the short side, especially with Jamari because he's such a good job of playing that high-low influence. He's you know really guessing at a high rate. If you're going to play even up formationally where you're not going to have you know three receivers to the wide side of the field most of the time, it does make you play in a smaller shoebox, but that corner game where you, that squat corner, that kind of goes away because now you have uh, vertical seam shots from usually a tight end and receiver on that side. And then you also have a quick outlet where now the running back is actually your third receiver that is added to both uh, sides of the field. And the way you can think about passing attacks is that you're always trying to overload in some manner. With Jonah Coleman now, he becomes that overload player wherever they want him on that third uh, when, they're, when you're even up like that. What you'll see out of this a lot and what I've seen them do at a really high level, and I think what they're going to do against Iowa, it's going to be an in- interesting interaction is – they like to play a hook, an in, a drag, anything to hold that interior zone defender, that linebacker, that safety, uh, and try and draw his eyes down. And then they like to sneak their larger receivers in behind. So mm-hmm. number six and Boston are both you know true X receivers that run that deep in really well. Rogers throws that ball well. Mm. It's a great way to attack zone. Why I think it's actually going to struggle a little bit against Iowa is that we really don't get influenced by lower level route concepts. We the way we play it is that anything that's occurring within eight yards and down, we actually play that as the defensive lines man. And what I mean by that is when you're a quarterback and you know all the linemen are stood up, all the defensive linemen are stood up, you can be influenced by that, you know, that four yard curl by that tight end. But the the throwing lane has to be there for that QB. Even though it feels like it from a linebacker perspective, that guy's wide open. Sometimes that QB can't see him. And if you can get you know, the way we play our D-line is they're always anticipating the pass. They're not, they're just bull rushing until they see the arm come up. That's actually supposed to be defended by the bat down. Mm-hmm. So when they play these levels concepts, this, again, this would be a very interesting, this th- interesting thing to see from Rodgers is does he immediately go down to the check down? Can we get bat downs there? Or Because I don't think we're going to get that, that, that bring up. I don't think you're going to see Higgins and Jackson action closely and let that deep end come behind it. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a lot of us actually backing up and then coming forward. And that's where I could see their passing attack taking a while to evolve. And their traditional passing sets out of shotgun are going to be, it's going to be very interesting to see how they react. Yeah. And I think two points on that. I think you're right. I think what you end up seeing QBs end up getting in a rhythm against Iowa is they make that read faster. And like as they get later in the game, the crowd gets it less as crazy. The pass rush, you know, generally maybe even cools down a little bit. And you'll see them make those decisions faster. Uh, and, like, the reason why you do that, the reason why you just basically don't assume the first-level passing attacks, drags, you know, hooks five yards, anything to perimeter for running backs or anything that's like a flat route for receiver is because most progressions move from deep to short. So that progression, if you instantly react to something at five yards or what less than five yards, that Kiwi's actually not going to hit that progression generally until he's, uh, you know, three seconds into his progression. So it's... You know, Phil's made a decision that, hey, if you don't play it, like you actually don't need to play it until late anyways. And you add in that factor as you broke down that defensive line, it kind of doubles onto it why, you know, why early in games QBs don't see it and then the their OC goes, dude. Like that's that, 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 that corner is at six yards, is getting ten yards of depth. Like just throw the freaking flat. So I think that it comes as a later point. It is a difficult thing though for a lot of these QBs where they're used to, you know, almost every single college defense that you play is hyper aggressive. They're mm-hmm. very reactive to f- stuff in front of them. They're trying to prevent every play for zero. Like that's like the ethos is negative plays, pass breakups, pass deflections, picks, all that. Yeah. Like defensive coordinators, that's always in their head. Phil is very much the opposite mentality where it's like, we're going to play our processing power. We're going to see, we're going to give you looks over and over again that allow you to take what's given. Mm-hmm. We're going to play your aggression against you where guys really want to make the big play we're not rushing the passer too. So you're also seeing, okay, I got a clean pocket as well. So it's all this mind game. And the faster that Rodgers picks up on that, 
Uh, that's going to really determine how well this passing attack goes. Yeah. And then again, coming back to the run game, if that run game is there early, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. I think it's time to move on to the Washington yeah. defense. I can start it out. Sure. So it's, if you don't know, it's a really interesting matchup. And like Jed Fish is known for offense, and obviously the coordinator he's brought on offense is doing a hell of a job. But I think the surprising aspect of this defense and this team right now, is, or this team as a whole, is how well is the defense is playing. I think they're top 25 in all the SP plus metrics and stuff like that. They don't flash as like a bunch of like individual personnel players you want to break down, like the safeties, like Caleb Downs, this linebacker's playing unreal. But with Steve Belichick as defensive coordinator, he's taking the approach of playing as multiple as possible in his formations, but not his plays. And honestly, breaking down the last, like all of last year, all the defenses we defenses we saw and all this year, like this is the most interesting for, like defensive strategy I've seen. It it goes from I say their base set, I still want to say it's like a three four is how they actually play it. But it kind of behaves like a 5-2, and we'll see a lot of 5-2 against Iowa. After breaking down all the formations from early this year, all the defenses we've played, and even last year, you start to see like a con- common like concepts, like 4-2-5, 4-3, you know, dime, nickel. And there's nothing that really jumps out to you. This is probably one of the most unique defenses I've seen in terms of just strategy and formations uh, in college football. Uh, you see 5-1-5s. I've seen four one sixes from these guys. I see, you know, one of the brilliant things they do is they can actually change formation two seconds before, and it can look radically different. And the key to this defense and why they actually have the ability to be so multiple and kind of have these confusing looks is they have dual position, position players. So number 11 can be a stand-up D end in a 3-4 scheme, or he can be a stand-up middle linebacker and which allows them to change formations two seconds before four play and have a completely different front and different look for the team. Then they have 13, who's a safety for them. He can play deep safety and play kind of like a rover back or a strong safety, but he also can roll up and play linebacker. And so when you have two different, and they have a D end that can roll down and play a three-tech D tackle. So when these three players can all change what position they play pre-snap, it allows you to be extremely multiple on what formations you can show three seconds before the ball is snapped and what you actually can play when the play is going on. And so you see them roll from a 4-2-5 into a 5-2-4 right before the snap. You can see them roll from a 5-1-5 into a 5-2-4. You can see them run a 4-1-6 and get down to a 4-2-5. And with all these rotating players, it, it really allows them to Confuse your blocking schemes because you don't know what front you're seeing moments before it's snapped. And then that, that's essentially it. So your your pass blocking gets more confusing, your gaps that your center's setting up as the play is starting. And it really worked against Rutgers because Rutgers is a check with me team. And so they're going, I got a 4-1-5 against 11 personnel set. I'm checking this to a run. You would see Cali Manis go to the line, check the play. It's some pretty picture of six DBs and five true like offensive alignment play. They roll a safety and they blitz C gap on the strong side instantly. And like truly why you, you think this like team is like we mentioned on offense, they have a hard time not getting penalties and kind of just executing as a hole in the red zone is that th- like both sides of the ball are throwing a lot of these guys. Like they're playing a lot of different formations, a lot of, Similar coverage, I'd say. Man, I, th- I think match. I think formationally they're very diverse, and that's again what you talked about. What that's doing to an OC is he's not going to get a look that he's anticipating. Mm-hmm. That really, that really hurts your script. You know, you come out, you try and learn how teams are going to line up a formation with you. If you're con- consistently evolving, that you have multiple fronts and multiple players, even personnel wise. You know, there's guys watching who's coming onto the field, what they're capable of running. Like you mentioned, if you have guys who can play D tackle and DN linebacker and outside linebacker, you can't tell from a personnel and subbing perspective what they're going to come out into. So that all plays into essentially what's happening in the press box is like that processing power or that consistency of what you're trying to look for is going to be very difficult for them to pick up on. I think where the issues lie or like the negatives of this is that you have guys we're going to be playing multiple positions. So are they going to be completely un- like understand what their gaps are, Assignments. how they're supposed to play a technique, how I think they limit that, uh, you know, potential for mistake is that they run very simplistic coverage in the back end. I don't think the rules change very much from formation to formation. Mm-hmm. 
And what you're going to see a ton out of is essentially two different coverages. It's either going to be a cover three match, which operates exactly the same as man to man, but how it differs is their linebackers don't know who they're going to guard until the play starts. So when you have these trade motions, you have all these motions pre-snap, you have even you know potential cuts where you'll have a tight end start on one side of the formation, have a play action where he ends up on the other side. Those switches could happen easily, and we actually saw Illinois uh, do that incredibly well well in the past against our boot pass where you would have guys communicating, okay, if, if this guy's in off position, he's capable of coming behind the line. We have to account for that guy on that backside boot. Illinois, this is a very similar uh, setup to Illinois where they're going to go nuclear, essentially every play, what we call, where it's going to be a lot of five fronts, a lot of six fronts. What man to man really allows to happen is the safeties are a lot more freed up to play the run. If they get run calls early, you're going to have, you know, eight and nine man boxes developing fairly quickly. Your corners are no longer essentially involved in run defense. They're just taking away the receiver play. How you can use that against them is it two ways I can think of quickly. We talk about how we have those outside zone sets where you'll have receivers coming in and crack on the safeties. If that corner is going to consistently come down, you can predict that corner is going to come down and play inside. You're going to be able to isolate Caleb Johnson on the edge. They do have a counter to that where they come out in that match where it's off corner play and they're not going to be as aggressive to that. But if you're seeing any press man, that's really where we're going to probably go to a lot is that that uh, trying to isolate that corner on Caleb Johnson. Another aspect is reverses. So mm-hmm. reverses are very much dependent on where the ball is going to. Say if you have a, a sweep or anything going left and then it's going to reverse back right, the defenders on that right side of the football, if you're influenceable in a man-to-man set where all of a sudden guys are going to be able to, guys are going to be able to take you with because your eyes are on those play side uh, offensive players. If guys can take you to the opposite side of the ball and you have a reverse coming around the opposite end, that's really where you can have large plays. It's going to really come down to you know their edge contain guy on recognizing that early. I could see Lester. I think where Lester's going to identify that is in the is just the reverse and sweep game is going to be used a ton. Yeah, because you have to take advantage of their ed, edge defenders not paying attention to the run. Right, and where we're going to see a lot of actually difficulty in our offensive attack is and why it's you know a little bit terrifying is you're going to be able to take away Caleb Johnson pretty well because mm-hmm. they're going to be able to play eight and nine guys to the ball very fast you're not going to have Caleb being to build up and you know accelerate to the second level they are very poor tackling secondary the issue is can you get Caleb free enough to that secondary where he can beat these guys um mm-hmm. uh, yeah I think, I think where it's going to have to come down to and this is you know this is why I have uh, doubts about this game is it, in, it when you play man to man and you're you're isolating corners that have to play the entire so, the entire field uh it comes down to can your receivers b- beat these guys one-on-one can your QB make the throw to beat these guys and then have explosive plays in the pass game that is how you are going to have continued success against this team mm-hmm. is through the passing game and mainly through receiver play yeah I, I I do think receiver play is huge I think that's definitely was my initial concern as well I do view like exactly what you said. I think reverses are huge. Like if you're gonna be changing formations and like you have like complex playbooks, like you see Steve Belichick's playbook on the sideline. It was two. It's a front and back full page playbook, and he's calling probably sixty different plays. It looks like like or formations throughout the game. Thus, anything that's gonna be complicated offensively, you know, could be huge because these guys are thinking through what is my pre snap movement, what is my assignment after pre snap. You know they're they're going through a, like their own process of like having to run their play correctly, and now they have to adjust to something that could be confusing at like post snap. I think that that could be a big thing. I also like the idea of RPOs or anything to the flats. When you run these formations in a five two set, you really isolate the corners, and you don't really have a secondary defender that can be, you know cleaning up any sort of RPO action, a bubble set, anything that boot action, because your DN is truly your first line defense, and then your linebackers are interior. They're, they're around B-gap, and safeties are around, you know, at max C-gap. And so you don't really have this, like, secondary defender if you can get past the DN, which is a really hard thing to do because those guys are essentially supposed to stop you getting off gap. Well, they, they have, like, almost solely D-gap responsibility because you're going to get such fast fill from the safeties and linebackers right. that – Getting to the edge against this could actually be very difficult with our run game. But you could put a lot of pressure on the pass game because those guys, essentially anything you put to the 
sideline. And like if you say if you just segment out the 15 yards on each hash, there's not many guys over there. This is truly just the way they're formationally set up, you know, with deep high safeties and rolling a lot and putting five on the defensive line. There truly isn't just, you know, a, a lot of ways for them to get high, low your route concepts. They don't have the overhead safety that's always going to be hanging over their corner, which allows the corner to squat. And so it's really going to be some, a lot of targeted throws to the sideline, a lot of RPOs to the sideline, in my opinion. But I think to reiterate your points about a 5-2 formation, like it's Belichick. It's his son. Like, if he's circling one guy, like, Belichick's one thing of his, like, if you want to break down his defensive philosophy, take away what you do best, make what you do what make you do what you suck at. And he's going to circle Caleb Johnson 100 times. He's going to go, we have to just call every single play to stop this guy because they haven't thrown for 100 yards yet, so make them throw. And no one's made explosive plays outside of him besides, you know, Gill against Illinois State. I do think we'll still have explosive runs, though, because – their defensive line is good. They hold up. They hold up well. They they stop your offensive line from getting a lot of movement and like running into each other, essentially blocking your linebackers. But as you mentioned, their secondary and linebackers aren't great tacklers. They aren't great at understanding the angles, and that's where I think they're just not very physical. They have a lot of they're soft. Yeah, it's it, the easiest way. To, it's the quickest way to put it. Is there's multiple times where you have running backs get to the second level of pace, and these guys are just not about it. Yeah, but. My again, my fear is just the overload and against the runs can be super heavy. Mm -hmm. Another way you'll see this team attack us is actually very similar to what Illinois does, and it's how it's actually wh why man to man becomes such an effective system is because you can pre snap figure out where an offense is most likely to attack you with a man to man route. Obviously, outside the numbers or outside breaking routes is where most teams go against man to man because corners when you are playing man to man are inside leverage, you know, trying to prevent you getting across their face. That's how big plays happen. So turning and out. turn you out, sidelines best defender in the field. You can knock them out for limited gain. It's also a longer throw. What that allows defense coordinators do is to align, give you something pretty in the in the you know in the, the, the original formation, and then drop whole defenders. So what we've seen against Michigan did this to us uh back in I think 2019. Um Illinois did, did this a really good job is that you'll see Say you have three receivers to the right, you have the wide side of the field is to your left. Drag route is likely where you're going to go with it. You're going to try and get someone across their face. You have a lot of space to work with. That receiver can get across them as long as he can set it, set it up correctly. You'll then have that left end drop into like a three or four yard coverage where that drag's going to happen. And corn, uh, QBs don't see it. You know, QBs see it really late. It's, you know, it happened at like a, a lower distance. That ability to play really effective double teams, as you call it, where you can pick the spot they're going to go to, you know, doubling an out route with uh, a safety at some point. Playing random match where, you know, you're anticipating man to man and then all of a sudden the, the corners are just sitting still. All those little games where you come out in man and then play, you know, the, all those uh, uh, counters, it's a scary thing for me to process because we're just we're not we're not used to that and we're not comfortable with it. So we're gonna get very basic in how we attack man. Mm -hmm. If you get basic in how you attack man, really smart coordinators like Belichick can guess where you're going. And I think that's gonna be their counter to our passing game. Yeah. So we mentioned at the top that we were gonna discuss why we think Sullivan's a better option for this game. When you play this aggressive five front man to man, adding essentially an extra man to the box. When you have a QB under center in Cade, who's not a threat to the edge in boot pass, you're not going to have to account for him ever running the ball on boot action. Out of shotgun, that gets even more limited because when you run uh, out of shotgun, you can't get to opposite D unless you have a running QB in that read option game. Now you add the equation in where you have rolled up safeties, guys playing fast. If you can never have that pull that we talked about with that read option play where guys can go to the right, you can pull a guy out quickly and get him on the edge. Everything's going to happen so fast. And without receivers getting off this press man look, without having tight ends being a focal point of this offense, Kate is just very limited in how he can benefit this team outside of just being an insanely accurate QB who protects the ball. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really seem like a very good option. It's a team that's going to push your buttons right away. You know, the, I think the way Kate is not going to get pulled in this game, in my opinion, I think what you might see a little bit more of is first down uh sullivan just because that's where you're trying to pick up three and four and kirk can justify okay 
this is a good place to employ our full playbook. We can run our read options. We can run our, our, our jet sweeps and stuff like that out of shotgun. But I really think that if you're going to play this game effectively and you're going to utilize this team's aggression against them, having a guy who is a threat to run, who can get on the edge, who has the height to even see the RPOs over the middle. You know, that's another aspect of this game is that I think you're going to want to attack this team over the middle in those man-to-man sets if they're going to play so fast. Mm-hmm. Having the taller QB in that scenario is a far better situation. Those two aspects... You know, you talk about just the lack of mobility Kate has, and we're just going to get blitzed at. Mm-hmm. Not having the guy who can move there, even if he's a less accurate guy, he's not going to be processing a lot of coverage in this game. Mm-hmm. You're not going to see a lot of you know, complex zone sets. It's going to be a lot of man, a lot of match. As long as you can avoid the big play, mm-hmm. the big pick, I think playing the more athletic guy who can get you hidden yardage is the way to go. Yeah, and we are clearly the defending Kate podcast from the start of the season during the season and it's weird like the game that we flip on him and the game that we actually want to see Sullivan full time like for Washington I, I do like I generally want to I think Kate could still play well in this game and, and play well, well for the rest of the season is that it all comes down to actually like not even him it's just our receivers just aren't there like if RVZ is going to be your number one option we've seen him not succeed in against Minnesota Iowa State and Ohio State like if that's your second option that you're going to on third down and first down and second down like uh, in the general short passing game and you can't count on him, then K doesn't make sense. It And it's not because he's improving. He just plays best half ever. He's clearly getting there. He's getting better. It just the passing game is not worth investing in, truly. That's like what it, you just don't have a passing game that ever will become something great. So just put the runner on the field and play college football. Just play college football. Had your numbers game, had more read option, have play, play breakdowns, have them scramble more, have them, you know, make the off-schedule plays. Just play like everyone else is playing and stop trying to play NFL football with Cade and go play college football with Sullivan. I think that's where we live. And I'd make one comment of how you can still use an RPO set in this game against a five front is just to have what LSU does is they will actually stack two receivers to the left side and then they'll shuttle out their tight end on a backside read. And we actually still see that kind of shuttle motion RPOs that we've kind of flashed against Minnesota. I think that's where we'll go to rather than read options is actually still have like a backside bubble on all your shotgun runs, especially against this five front where you're, you know, you're going to have a really condensed def- and defense. You have a free DN. You have a free DN. So I still think you can still create that look with Cade, but I don't care that that look is still possible with the RPO game. I don't think the passing game downfield is worth it. You're, your max throw with Kate's 15 yard in route. And it's that's why you're getting at 100 yards because you don't have a nine route receiver or post route receiver. And you're just playing this like high, like high end passing attack. And it's just it's not, a high wire attack that's not repeatable. It's just not sustainable. And also, the thing I was thinking about as I was watching the Ohio State game is those third and sixes and third and sevens where we'd just be forced to go to a check down. Cade necessarily didn't have pressure in those moments. But he doesn't trust himself to escape the pocket. Skin ball out. He wants ball out. So, re- I mean, as I'm describing that, Kirk's not going to like that idea. If you watch enough college football, extending plays by QB is sometimes actually a negative. Guys, you can make it a negative point, but yeah. You can make it a negative point. If a guy holds the ball, allows for pass rushers to get closer, strip sack goes up exponentially. Injury to QB goes up a ton. A lot of the times the QBs don't have the, you know, arm talent to make the throw they need to when the play breaks down. It's actually a very difficult play, but you see guys like Mahomes and Allen do it, and then everyone goes, so you extend the plays exactly how you want to play football. That's how you have high-end QB play. Mm-hmm. Um, I think more just you just need an aspect of a running QB in this game. If they're Again, if they're going to add numbers to the box, making them have to play two or three different options even where you have – Sullivan get on the edge with an option to pass at that moment. All that, it just helps us often stay on schedule. And I think under center, the boot game gets immensely better with mm-hmm. Sullivan because you get him on the edge and teams have to account for him and he can go lay up, lay on a, a, a corner or a safety with his size. I think it's time to wrap it up and do a prediction. First off, we'll caveat it and say we're going to do our additional uh, Patreon episode at the end of this. Obviously, Caleb Brown... Um, and LaShawn Williams transferring from the program. Uh, we'll cover that. We'll cover NI as a whole, like the additions we've had, how this team needs to focus it differently. We'll break down Jimmy Sullivan, uh, which we've been asked to do by a Patreon member, and uh, our new QB uh, recruit, Cash, 
and kind of give a full scope of like how QB recruiting has changed, where Leicester is clearly going with it, and kind of give a full breakdown of also like what Leicester was require on a recruiting front. So we really want to have our aspect of our this podcast to always be the same. We we have enjoyed building our listener base. We always want to be game previews and game breakdowns. But I think the hot topics of like what is going on in the program and like week to week that's kind of outside the scope of just like schematic breakdowns and personnel breakdowns is where Patreon's going to live. And that's where we kind of want to create that value of just that additional, you know, hey, I want, you know, 45 more minutes of these guys each week and our more deeper thoughts on the program as like a holistic view in even recruiting and, or and like also like very distinct player breakdowns. And I think because it's, you know, a private uh, forum, we'll, you'll get a little more of our unfiltered opinions on stuff. Yeah. Uh, I think that's going to help with some of this discussion around you know, some of the more edgy topics where we're not going to want to put that on YouTube mm-hmm. uh, and then make it, make it more of, you know, a communal thing as well. Yeah. And then obviously if you're a Patreon member, you'll be able to dictate, you know, where our content goes on that facet. So if you have certain questions about the program, if you want us to explain know some of the isms that we use on this podcast i think that's a great way to start yeah i think any any time we use a term that you don't understand anything that you know give me a full breakdown of like all of our coverages from phil parker give us you know your breakdown of uh mason richmond's play this year i think anything that's like very specific that you just are interested in or anything that's broad of like hey every time you bring up timed up by qe throwing out what does that mean and we can give you a full breakdown of that so we want more targeted responses to help build out your listening experience where you're just kind of like, oh, I don't know. We're building out a dictionary of the podcast. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where we kind of view it going. And I think it's time to give a prediction on the actual game. Yeah. Next time you're looking for an all-inclusive beach vacation, consider Via Puesa del Sol or Via Puerto Escondido, both of which overlook the Pacific Ocean and Ocotal, Costa Rica, providing an exceptional all-inclusive experience for your family and friends. Visit their website, linked down below, for more information or to reserve your trip today. I think where it lies, and I, we broke this down, is I think they're going to be able to take away our run game. I think with that that aggressive man-to-man sets where you're going to have safeties playing fast and you're going to have a lot of five- and six-man fronts. We saw it with Illinois last year. Even if you are blocking well at certain points, the man advantage and the numbers of it all really uh, hurts you. So it's going to slow down our run game. I don't think the passing attacks where it needs to be in any sense of the fashion. When it comes down to what they're going to be able to do on offense, I think this is going to be a very effective offense against our defense. I think that with the passing attack and the timing that these guys have early, the receiver play they have, uh, Jonah Coleman being a playmaker at running back, their tight end being usable, their scheme just in general, keeping you off the front foot a lot of the time, and then having you know a very effective QB, I, don't, I see this as a loss. I don't. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to go 27-21 Washington. Yeah, I think when I broke this game down two days ago, like on, you know, post like Saturday night, started looking at it, and then Sunday morning looking at it, that was my exact conclusion. I was like, these guys on offense are actually playing much better than they're being shown on film, and I mean on in their stat book and their points per game, they're playing really impressive. Rodgers is playing great ball, and they have great skill. The more I watch them. The moments they have against Rutgers where they're getting gashed for 25 yards and on offense, you see a few of the run plays kind of go for one or two yards. Like it still looks like they have like the high level requirements of like watching them. It's just like, oh, this is a great team. But like to beat Iowa in what Kinnick will be this Saturday where these seniors are playing their last, possibly last meaningful game of the season. Like that's a reality. You lose this game, like all your goals are gone. And the Iowa fan base knows that well. It's been a frustrating start to the season as a whole. So Kinnick will be reactionary to anything that goes positive. And it's going to be loud from the jump. You're playing Washington. They were in a national title last year. Very recognizable brand. You're not playing some, you know, Purdue at home where you're just sleeping through every third down. I think this is where the emotional bounce back aspect of both teams where we just got our ass kicked and on the road and they just had a big time win at home and they looked great against Michigan. Now they have to travel two time zones and play an 11 a.m. game against the team they've never seen before on film, a program they've never, a stadium they've never even, you know, even cared about. And you're playing this really weird environment, and you show up and it's packed, and it's striped, <laughs> and there's and they have they hit. I think it just it it's all my my pick is just I think these teams are close. I think Washington is a better, more skilled. Like honestly, you can even argue better coach team than us. I think we're just catching them at the very right moment where we're in a desperate state. Like there's some buzz around this program that's kind of negative at the point. And I think you catch them where 
they're coming in a little too high into our stadium. And it's, it's hard to argue against you. I think they're going to throw against us, which is our weakness. And I think they're going to stop our run. But I think just as a, what Kirk does well is bounce back in these situations where it seems like we're in a bad spot. I remember picking against us in Purdue last year where it felt like a very type of similar style, throwing the ball team with a lot of talent, 5-2 front, and we end up controlling most of that game and winning it. I think it's, it's going to be similar to that one. So I'm going to go 21-17 Iowa. I think take the control late third, and we kind of ride it out to the crowd just kind of carries us, and it kind of bounce backs our season as a whole. I think it's time to move on to our so picks. picks. Yep. So I went 2-0 uh, and last week. Uh, had Ohio State minus 20 and a half. It's a gross win, but we'll take it. I think we just saw the writing on the wall when it came into that one. Uh, had Minnesota plus nine against USC. They actually ended up pulling the win out. You got P.J. Fleck in full form. I don't know if I've ever seen a more psychotic coach. He was in a mood. He was in a mood. <laughs> desperate for a win. Uh, D-line showed up for them as we anticipated. Honestly, it, makes great it was a very big win for Iowa's credibility. You know, beating that Minnesota team by 17 at home and then having USC step into that environment and lose, it shows where, you know, we're, this is the big 10 is essentially now the NFL where mm -hmm. you have giant matchups every weekend. Even if you have a downturn, you're going to have more and more opportunities to get it back as, uh, than you would have in the past in the big 10 West. Mm -hmm. I think for picks this week, if you go back out and look at UCLA's rush defense, they've been fantastic. They held uh, Penn state to a really low uh, rush total. A couple other games this season, they've been really good against the rush. I think Minnesota in a sleepy game, you know, at UCLA, traveling a couple of time zones over, coming off an emotional win, they're going to be, and Brosmer has just not looked very effective still. He still has his moments where they're not trusting him. He's a lot, still a check down Charlie. I think they're going to be very passive in their approach, and that's going to lead to a lot of runs. Like we mentioned, UCLA is just not there offensively right now. They're down, they're playing, their, they're at their backup QB. Um, they're a decently effective running team, but they're, they're overall their offensive uh, skill talent is just not there. So I'm going to go – I haven't done this yet, but I'm going to take uh, the first half under and the full game under. So I think the first half under – it's a 40.5-point line, so the first half under is going to end up at probably 20. Mm -hmm. If you get 20, take it. If you get 19.5, don't take it. For the full game under at 40.5, I'll take that as well. Uh, Ohio State goes to Oregon, plays a gigantic game. I got an opportunity, obviously, to watch the Ohio State game against Iowa – and then watch uh, Oregon play Michigan State. Oregon obviously looks great. I think where they fall short is their QB play, and we saw what Ohio State's capable on both sides of the ball. So I'll, I'll take Ohio State minus four there, and then for uh, the Iowa-Washington game, I'll take Washington plus three. Nice. Well, I completely flipped my script last week. I, if you guys listened to that portion, I just went with the grossest lines I could find. I, I was four and eight going into this week. I ended up three and one. I should have been four and zero. Oh. I'm going to keep it the same strategy. Uh, last week I had Georgia Tech plus or minus eight, gross line one. Kansas plus three. They were up by three with two minutes left, lost. Felt great the entire bet. Um, had Nebraska minus seven, felt great. They're up 14 rip, you know, kind of control most of that game. And then had, uh, who's the last one? Washington minus two and a half. They won by 10. And I was telling you all game, this seems like it's just a Washington by 10 game. So I'm keeping the same strategy. Lines I hate, just like stuff that you're trying to fit, like figuratively understand why the line is that, and then just taking those. Um, because all the analysis in my past was always just talking me into stuff I didn't want to be on and had some really bad losses, like Michigan and Maryland broke my brain. Um, so I'm going to do Texas minus 14 against Oklahoma. Red River rivalry, massive rivalry game. Like there's 14 points, public is going to bet Oklahoma. They will. They're going to see that 20 minutes before a kick. They want Oklahoma. Give me Texas. Ohio State minus four against Oregon. Once again, two undefeated teams, top five mat matchup at Oregon. People are going to talk themselves into Oregon plus four. They're going to see the advantages of losing by three. Just give me Ohio State. I think Jeremiah Smith is obviously, if you're going to do any analysis, Oregon does not have Jeremiah Smith. Give me the same line he had. UCLA plus five and a half against Minnesota. Minnesota obviously has this massive win against USC and then now are playing a one win UCLA team and are not even touchdown favorites. Give me UCLA. USC versus Penn State. Penn State's undefeated, ranked fourth in the country going on the road to UCLA. USC, only five and a half point favorites. Doesn't make sense again. So give me that one as well. And then Kentucky minus 10 against Vandy. Vandy is once again, the darling child of college football. Kentucky played Georgia tough. They beat Ole Miss. I think this is actually a very good Kentucky team. 
And now you get to capitalize on everyone going, Vandy's actually pretty good. And they didn't lose to Georgia Southern last week. So that's another line you look at. You're like, how is Kentucky one covered by 10? They probably went by 20. I think I got one more. Let me look it up. Ooh, this is nice. It's a revenge bet. Uh, West Virginia plus three against Iowa State. I think this is, once again, undefeated 11th ranked team on the road against undefeated uh, non-ranked team. The differences in those teams isn't that much. And get them at night at home. And West Virginia's got a great home crowd. I think plus three is it's going to look like a great bet for Iowa State at minus three, but that's actually going to be a really good game. All right. That's it. All right. We'll see you over on the Patreon side. Yeah. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.